everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nikita <clears throat> Bailey, and I'm an executive vice president here at the Center for Responsible Lending. Thank you for joining today's per virtual discussion to commemorate 10 years since Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act was signed into law, which created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Today's talk will focus on the civil rights group's push for Dodd-Frank, a reflection on the CFPB's work and hopes for the future. We'll also talk about Dodd-Frank's impact on communities of color and on current institutional barriers to full and fair economic equity and inclusion, especially during this time of COVID-19 and its disproportionate public health impact on communities of color. To kick off our event, I have the great privilege of introducing a longtime board member and former leader of the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights, Mr. Wade Henderson. During Wade's tenure at the Leadership Conference, he steered successful campaigns to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act, pass the Help America Vote Act, the Fair Sentencing Act, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the Matthew Shepard and James Baird Pay Crimes Prevention Act, and the Dodd-Frank Act. Thank you for joining today's discussion. Wade, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Nikitra, for that introduction and for your incredible leadership in leveling the playing field for working families. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we begin, I, I wanna recognize the passing of my good friends and mentors in the cause for justice, uh, Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Uh, we fought many fights together and we got into a lot of good trouble. Uh, we miss them both terribly, but we must now carry on their work to make our country a fairer and more just place for everyone. And with your permission, I'd like to dedicate today's program to the memories of Congressman Lewis and Reverend Vivian. Now, I'm grateful for the Center for Responsible Lending for organizing this event today with a specific lens on civil rights. As someone who has spent a lifetime fighting for civil and human rights, I recognize all too well this moment in time and the pain we're all living through. Now, people of color across the country and poor people, regardless of race, are suffering the worst impacts of an unprecedented economic crisis and are in need of the protections and resources that will allow them to recover. Once again, we find ourselves having to fight for these resources to which we are entitled as citizens with all of our strength and energy. Now, our first special guest is no stranger to these fights. I have the privilege of introducing Congresswoman and Chairman Maxine Waters, who indeed now is the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, and she is a powerful and fearless and tireless leader. We could not ask for a better champion working alongside us for the change that will eradicate racial injustice in our systems, protect the dignity of all Americans and workers, and create a future where our children not only survive, but thrive. Now, from her early uh, wins in uh, building uh, economic infrastructure, and Maxine Waters has a very uh, strong record, she has a remarkable career, which began with her working in her teen years at a garment factory. She went on to graduate from California State University, Los Angeles, and taught in Head Start programs. She then became chief deputy to a city council member, and shortly thereafter was elected to the California Assembly, where she served for 15 years, championing causes including divestment of the state pension from apartheid South Africa and enacting police reforms. And let me say, she was one of the most effective advocates for uh, apartheid, uh, anti-apartheid uh, reform. She was phenomenal and her work there reverberated all the way to Washington. In 1991, she was elected to Congress from South Los Angeles following the esteemed representative and chairman, Augustus Hawkins, upon his retirement. In her time in Congress, she has consistently been an early champion for progressive causes. In 2005, she took on predatory for-profit schools and continues today to work to enforce accountability for them. 
And early on, she recognized the dangers of predatory mortgage lending. In recognition of her work, her colleagues elected her to chair the Congressional Black Caucus in 1997. Now, during the fight for Dodd-Frank, Congresswoman Waters championed Section 342, establishing the offices of minority and women inclusion in all of the financial regulators, a powerful group of agencies desperately in need of diversity and inclusion. Personnel is policy. She knew that, she knows it now. And she has put in place a structure to change that personnel and make it diverse. She has subsequently been a fierce defender of the CFPB, including its work to end auto lending discrimination. Now, since assuming her position as chairwoman of the powerful Financial Services Committee, she has redirected the focus of the committee to ensuring the interests of working Americans that they're served and rather than the special interests. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chairwoman Maxine Waters to the podium. Madam Chair. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the Center for Responsible Lending for inviting me to join this event focused on the civil rights fight behind Dodd Frank. And thank you to you, Wade Henderson, a champion for civil rights throughout your distinguished career uh, for that great introduction again. As we face a pandemic crisis in which communities of color are suffering disproportionately, both from the coronavirus and its economic impacts, it's important for all of us to remember that the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act was passed in response to another crisis, which had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, the financial crisis of 2008. Leading into the 2008 crisis, predatory mortgage lenders peddle toxic home loans, no-doc loans, interest-only loans, and other exotic products and targeted them specifically to communities of color. Minority families that qualified for prime loans were instead steered into these costly subprime products. The end result was a massive foreclosure crisis in which trillions of dollars of wealth was lost and millions of families lost their homes through no fault of their own. When the crisis cascaded, to bring large financial institutions to the brink of failure, the federal government stepped in to bail out a number of them. But for many families across the country who had been preyed upon with these exploding mortgages, there was no financial rescue coming. More than a decade later, many communities of color still have not recovered the massive loss of wealth that resulted from the crisis. Congress had to take action to fix the many problems with the under-regulated financial system that the crisis had so painfully revealed. And so, in passing the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress took essential measures to ensure that consumers, investors, and the economy were better protected from a future crisis. We outlawed the predatory mortgage products that had proliferated in the lead up to the crisis. We created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, that is FSOP, and impose robust capital, liquidity, leverage, stress testing, and living will requirements on the largest financial institutions. We also banned banks from gambling with taxpayer money through the Volcker Rule and created a new regulatory regime for the previously unregulated derivatives market. I'm so very proud to have contributed to a section of the law which required the federal financial services agencies under my committee's jurisdiction and each of the Federal Reserve Banks to establish the offices of minority and women inclusion known as AMWI. They were tasked with, among other things, collecting and reporting on diversity data from the entities they regulate. As the centerpiece of this landmark law, we created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an independent watchdog agency tasked 
with protecting consumers from predatory and abusive financial products and practices. Never before had consumers had a dedicated federal agency to watch out for their interests in the financial marketplace. And under the leadership of its first director, Richard Cordray, the agency delivered outstanding results for the public. The Consumer Bureau put millions of dollars back into the pockets of consumers who had ripped them off and successfully put a stop to many bad acts by financial institutions. And so I cannot go any further without saying none of this would have happened. The Consumer Financial Bureau could not have happened without Senator Elizabeth Warren. This was her dream. This was her vision. And this is what we adopted. The progress we made in Dodd-Frank was hard earned. Many of the organizations participating in this event fought tirelessly for the key reforms that we secured. And the battle over Dodd-Frank did not end with this passage. When I became ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee after Barney Frank's retirement, I had the ongoing task of working to fend off Committee Chairman Jeb Hinterland's many efforts to unravel the law. So despite the many lessons of the financial crisis, the chairman was determined to erase as much of the progress we made in Dodd-Frank as possible. I'm proud to say that as ranking member, I called him to task and fought his harmful efforts to every step of the way. After the public voted for a new House Democratic majority in 2018, I became the first woman and the first African-American to lead the Financial Services Committee as chair. So as chairwoman, I have worked every single day to defend Dodd-Frank and the Consumer Bureau, to advance legislation to reverse the damage that the Trump administration has done to the Consumer Bureau, and to provide additional consumer protections. Trump administration appointees to the Consumer Bureau have taken steps to destroy the agency from the inside. In response, I put forth the Consumer's First Act, that is H.R. 1500, legislation to block the Trump administration's anti-consumer agenda and reverse their efforts to undermine the mission of the Consumer Bureau. The legislation passed the House in May of 2019, and I am continuing to conduct strong oversight over Trump administration appointees, not just at the Consumer Bureau, but all of the financial regulatory agencies. And so as I alluded to at the beginning of my remarks, during this pandemic, we're now facing another crisis in which communities of color are suffering disproportionately. I've been working around the clock to ensure that Congress provides protections and relief to the many families across the country that suffering during this crisis and that communities of color and low income communities have access to new and existing relief efforts. When the Paycheck Protection Program, that is PPP, funds were being channeled from big banks to their large business clients while many minority owned businesses were shut out, I took action. My colleagues and I urged the Federal Reserve Chair and the Treasury Secretary to make administrative changes so that programs like the PPP and Main Street Lending Facility are open and accessible to minority owned businesses. I'm very pleased to say that they listened and set aside additional funds for community development financial institutions, that CDFIs, including those that are minority depository institutions, MDIs, which were well positioned to serve minority owned businesses. Now, we do have more work to do, and I will keep fighting for these small businesses, which are pillars of our communities. As the expiration of federal, local, and state eviction and foreclosure bans approach, and the unemployment benefits we passed through the CARES Act run out, we are now on the precipice of a disastrous wave of evictions and foreclosures. The House took action in May to provide much needed additional relief, including rental 
and mortgage assistance through the passage of the HEROES Act. But in the Senate, Mitch McConnell has blocked the bill. The stock market has largely recovered from steep losses that were experienced in earlier, earlier in this crisis, in large part because the Fed has pumped trillions of dollars into the markets. But the crisis on Main Street is continuing to grow worse and worse. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure that Congress provides families with the essential relief that is so urgently needed. So my friends, in conclusion, I wanna thank you again for inviting me to join you to discuss the Dodd-Frank Act and the 10th anniversary of the law. The civil rights and advocacy groups participating in this event played such an important role in fighting for the law. And I'm deeply appreciative of your continuing work to stand up for communities of color and the fight for consumer protection. Again, I wanna thank you so very much for inviting me here today. Oh, <clears throat> Chairman Waters, thank you so much. Thank you for those incredible remarks. Thank you for all of the work you have done throughout the years to make this a better country. And thank you most importantly for all that you continue to do to make America live up to its ideals. And we so value you and so appreciate you. And thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And now colleagues, I have uh, the great pleasure of introducing uh, another uh, extraordinary uh, activist and someone who uh, brings a great uh, leadership uh, to her role uh, as uh, a senator uh, from uh, Massachusetts. In just a one moment. Apologies. I had my uh, remarks here and somehow had mis misplaced them or mislaid them. So hang on for one second, guys. I appreciate it. I now have the uh, privilege, of course, of introducing someone who, <laughs> as with Congresswoman Maxine Waters, really needs no introduction. But nonetheless, it is a great privilege for me uh, to do that. I have the distinct honor to welcome one of the nation's most fierce advocates uh, for consumers and working families. Now, before she was a senior senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren was a professor who had an idea. That is, America should have an eight, a federal agency whose sole purpose is to look out for consumers and their interests. That agency was later called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Elizabeth Warren was its architect. She fought to make it a reality. It wasn't easy. Big structural change never comes easily, but she never gave up hope. She kept going and not nonetheless, uh, she persisted as they have said in the past on other issues involving Elizabeth Warren, she persisted, okay? Now, one of the reasons Senator Warren kept going is because she knows that structural barriers for communities of color and the poor are deeply embedded into our financial system, our housing system, our education system, and more. She knows that black and brown Americans are more likely to fall into bankruptcy, uh, become victims of predatory lenders, and face countless other challenges and blatant discrimination while trying to take care of basic needs. After a long and tough road to becoming a law professor, she graduated from Rutgers and uh, just a few years behind me, Senator Warren, I'm so honored that we went to the same school. She did groundbreaking research that showed the real reasons that families were being driven into bankruptcy was by events like unaffordable medical debt, despite their struggling hard to make ends meet. And I have the privilege of saying that before Senator Warren was the national figure she is now, she served as a pro bono volunteer. If you could believe this, Congress would mortar. She served as a pro bono volunteer for me when I worked as the director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau, okay? I was able to use her research and her work in fighting against the bankruptcy bill of the day because Senator Warren was so committed to making it happen 
and volunteer for the NAACP in DC for this purpose. It was a wonderful experience all the way around. She went on to show how our financial system is rigged to create obstacles for working families to achieve financial stability and advancement while it directs most of the gains to the very rich. Now, as a Senator on the Banking Committee, she is renowned for her tough questioning. Ask several of the former bank CEOs who have experienced it. She continually fights to make our financial system work for us. Most important for today's discussion, she did something about it. She proposed the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an idea that at the time was widely attacked both as a threat to the financial industry and almost being uh, impossible to achieve. Martin Eakes remembers this uh, because Martin and I were on an advisory board for economic inclusion at the FDIC. And that is where Elizabeth Warren laid out her proposal one afternoon to the uh, shock and astonishment of many of us there. It just sounded so incredibly fanciful. You know, some of us said it could possibly happen, but boy, were we wrong and are we glad we were. So, um, you know, she's really been incredible. And despite the criticism, she went on to design it, was instrumental in enacting it, started up the agency from scratch, and has been one of its toughest defenders. Repeatedly, she has advanced progressive plans and overcome initial skepticism. In addition to the CFPB, she was the first to call for bank CEOs to step down when their institutions abused customers, and her proposals for a wealth tax were initially attacked as socialism, and they are now supported by the majority of Americans. As with Chairman Waters, we are extremely pleased to have our next speaker, Senator Elizabeth Warren, speak to this important anniversary of which she had so much to do to make happen. Senator Warren, it's such a pleasure to have you. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Wade. I really do appreciate the kind words and also the great memories here. You know, I am so honored to be here with you today to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Dodd-Frank. And I have always cherished our friendship and I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the ongoing fight for justice. I am also especially grateful to mark this monumental achievement with a champion for consumers and working families, a woman whose lifelong commitment to public service has broken down barriers and opportunities for countless Americans, a woman who is a true national treasure, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And before I move further, I want to give a huge thank you to the Center for Responsible Lending for bringing us all here today. You know, the fallout from the one-two punch of a pandemic and Republican efforts to deregulate our financial institutions has put our economy in great danger, which makes CRL's watchdog efforts more important than ever. For the better part of two decades, the Center for Responsible Lending has been on the front lines fighting to ensure a fair, inclusive financial system for Americans who've just been locked out of opportunity and left behind. Without the incredible work that CRL has been doing, millions of families would be devastated and our economy would be in even worse shape. I am also very happy to be here with the founder of CRL, Martin Eakes. Martin has devoted his life to promoting fairness and building financial security for all Americans with a particular mission to serve people of color. It has been a privilege to learn from Martin and to fight alongside him in the trenches. So thank you all for having me here. You know, I wanted to join tonight's call for two reasons. The first is to say thank you. 10 years ago, in the wake of the financial crisis, we were fighting to pass Dodd-Frank and create the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Everyone who's here tonight knows what happens, but it's very important that we never forget what brought us into this fight. Like so many of our nation's problems, the financial crisis was a toxic mix of racism, corruption, and shameless greed. Predatory mortgage lenders started by targeting black and brown communities where they began clawing away at the hard-earned wealth of black and brown families. 
and too few people in power could be relied on to care. Not the investors who were making money hand over fist, not the regulators who were cozy with the banks, not the pundits who blamed the borrowers, not the lenders who were boosting their profits. They didn't care because it was only happening in certain communities, communities of color. At its core, the financial crisis was a massive theft of power from millions of Americans, a massive theft of the American dream. In the crash of 2008, millions of people lost their jobs, millions lost their savings, millions lost their homes. And maybe one of the most galling parts was that the Wall Street mega banks, whose recklessness helped crash the economy, they weren't ashamed. Nope, just the opposite. They took taxpayer handouts and then they doubled down with armies of lobbyists and lawyers trolling the halls of Capitol Hill, spending a million dollars a day to bury Dodd-Frank and kill the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau before it was ever even signed into law. The pundits all thought we were gonna lose that fight. After all, the big banks had all the money in the world, but we had the people and we got organized. Advocates jumped in, including um, unions and consumer groups, groups whose first mission was not consumer credit, civil rights activists and organizations like the NAACP and the National Fair Housing Alliance and the Leadership Conference got into the fight. You made your voices heard, but you did more. From the halls of Congress to the street corners and courthouses, you helped build a grassroots movement that demanded accountability from government whose racist, corrupt policies had stripped generations of opportunity from black and brown families. It was an extraordinary time of civic engagement and activism. It was a turning point in the fight for social, racial, and economic justice. Individuals who had never been in politics, including me, were suddenly knee deep in working on plans to get us out of the crisis. And we were blessed to have great leadership in the White House with President Obama standing firm even when some Democratic advisors were telling him to throw the agency overboard. But President Obama didn't fight alone. Vice President Joe Biden fought alongside him. He worked at it, calling on relationships in Congress to help get a workable bill and to pull it across the finish line. And we did it. With his help and so many others, we made it through the Senate without a single vote to spare. Think about that. It was a David versus Goliath story. Even when the banks spent hundreds of millions of lobbying dollars against us, we won. For once, American families beat back the big banks. The story of Dodd-Frank and the story of the CFPB is a story of what's possible when people come together and demand change. And that change was possible only because of so many of the people on this call who fought so tirelessly. So from the bottom of my heart, I wanted to be here tonight to say thank you. Thank you for your courage, your activism, your determination, because you helped change the course of history. But I also wanted to join you this evening because we know that our work is far from over. The creation of the CFPB was a critical moment for our economy. It was a moment to decide what kind of rules of the road we would have to protect families and prevent another crash. It was also a critical moment for our democracy. After years and years of Wall Street running wild and racist policies being weaponized against communities of color, the fight for economic justice reached a new threshold. We built a watchdog capable of looking out for communities of color, a watchdog that could get rid of tricks and traps, a watchdog that could cut away reams of fine print that took away consumers' rights, a watchdog 
to hold financial institutions accountable when they break the law. On the day that we won, Republicans and bank lobbyists declared it's only halftime. They said they would continue their war against the CFPB and their war against the American consumer. And that's exactly what they did. Legislation to eliminate the CFPB has been introduced in the House and the Senate in every single Congress since the agency was created in 2011. Republicans have engaged in one harebrained scheme after another to undermine the agency's leadership. But here's the thing. After years of industry attacks and GOP opposition last month, the Supreme Court recognized what we knew all along. The CFPB and the law that created it are constitutional. The little agency is here to stay. But we have a fight on our hands, and here's why. The CFPB is a roadmap for structural change, big structural change, the kind of change that dismantles generations of systemic racism and discrimination. And that has had Republicans shaking in their boots for years. Dodd Frank and the CFPB show that government can be a force for good. Under the faithful and persistent leadership of Rich Cordry, the American people witnessed what is possible when government is designed to protect and serve the people. Since it was created, the CFPB has delivered for American consumers. It's helped more than 26 million Americans directly. It has forced banks and financial institutions to return more than $12 billion directly to people they cheated, including $80 million directly to 235,000 Black, Latino, and AAPI borrowers who were forced to pay higher interest rates on auto loans than white borrowers, regardless of their credit scores. $25 million to residents in Black and Latino neighborhoods in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania who were victims of modern-day redlining and $169 million to 108,000 borrowers who were not offered financial products that they were otherwise qualified for because they had indicated a preference to communicate with their bank in Spanish or because they had a mailing address in Puerto Rico associated with their account. That consumer agency has handled more than 2.2 million complaints it has put in place common sense protection for American service members and vets. And a part we can never quite measure is that over the past decade, millions of people have not been cheated because some financial outfit with a sleazy idea looked around and realized there's a watchdog who will bite. The creation of the CFPB teaches us that we can make government work, not just for the wealthy and well-connected, but we can make it work for everyone. We are here tonight in remembrance of a brave and heart-fought and creative response to the 2008 crisis, but there's more. We're here tonight to celebrate how we have stood with our intellectual and political forebearers to use government as a force for good. We have much work ahead of us and the path will be difficult. Much of the time, we will be fighting the Republicans and their wealthy donors, also known as the party of no. But we will find a fight on because we know the America we are fighting for. An America where decisions in Washington are made with compassion, common sense, and moral clarity. An America where a run-in with law enforcement or a turn down the wrong street corner won't cost someone their life because of the color of their skin. An America where every working person, regardless of race, sex, or economic background, is paid a living wage. That's the America. The America we will build together when we beat Donald Trump elect Joe Biden, put Democrats in a position to make change in 2021. We know this is not going to be an easy fight, but we don't take on this fight because it's easy. 
nothing important ever is. We take on this fight because it is right. And if we stand together, if we fight together, if we persist together, we can build an America that works better for all of our families. Thank you. Wow. Senator Warren, thank you so much. Thank you for your vision. Thank you so much for your commitment. And thank you most of all for your voice, your inspiration for bringing what we needed to hear today on this 10th anniversary to celebrate this occasion. Thank you again, Senator Warren, and thank you again, Congresswoman and Chair Maxine Waters. It's really been an honor to introduce both of you. Thank Nikitra. you. Thank you, Wade. At this moment, we'll take our program over to our CEO, Martin Eats, but I also wanna just say thank you to both of our leaders who are going to lead the program at this moment. We are fortunate to have had you join us today. Thank you. Uh, I will be very brief. I want to offer a note of optimism for the future, which is not easy in these troubling times. But I wanna look back at 2000 through 2007, where the majority of all loans offered to African-Americans, mortgage loans to African-Americans and Latinos, we're exploding adjustable rate mortgages that after two years would increase the monthly payment by 40%, even if interest rates stayed the same. They were foreclosure machines, the majority of all mortgages offered back then. And who would have thought we'd come out of that with the Dodd-Frank protections that stopped those abuses from going forward and with the CFPB that would be the watchdog that we needed. And really, I want to say to Wade Henderson, to Hillary Shelton, to Orson Aguilar, uh, the folks from the Leadership Conference, from UNIDOS, from the NAACP, were there every step of the way. And without them, there would be no Dodd-Frank. There would have been no correction. And going forward, with leaders like Congresswoman Waters, whom you heard from, and Senator Warren, who I tell you, they are hated when a bank CEO receives their phone call. I used to think they hated to hear from me, but they really don't like to hear from these two champions because they are fearless tigers and they're still with us and they're gonna fight through this pandemic. And our next calling is going to be not just to eliminate the wealth gap between black, white, and Latino, but it has become a wealth canyon between people of color and white Americans in the average. And we will have to do more than just watchdog. We are going to have to invest money going forward to bring the home ownership rate for black and brown up to the American average. And I'm optimistic because of the people who've been in this battle for so long and the people who are still with us and the victories that have been won. So I just wanna say thank you to all of the people who are on this call who have been part of that struggle and have made it a reality. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Martin. We're so grateful for the opportunity to have you join us briefly today. At this point, we are now heading into our discussion and it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator who will take over and kick things off from this point. Today's moderator is Washington Post reporter, Danielle Douglas Gabriel. Danielle's background in economics of education and banking perfectly intersect for what it is we're going to talk about today. We're grateful to have her. We also have a dynamic set of panelists. Our fearless leader, Mike Calhoun, is president of the Center for Responsible Lending, and he will be amongst the panelists today who will definitely drop gems. Mike has for many, many years led as a consumer protection and civil rights advocate, doing wonderful work in the state of North Carolina, specifically in communities in Durham, where he fought to ensure that historically African-American communities in Haiti were not taken apart by our Department of Transportation and plans around the highway. We're pleased to have you, Mike, thank you. We also have what we all like to refer to as our 101st Senator, Mr. Hillary Shelton from the NAACP. Hillary is the director of the Washington Borough and senior vice president for policy and advocacy. 
we have, and I'm most excited about, our dear friend, Seema Agnani. Seema is the Executive Director of National Capacity. Capacity is a voice and a leader in all of these battles, and we are so privileged to continue to benefit from Seema's great leadership. And I'm also pleased to have Orson here with us today because Orson was a leader at another organization when we were all fighting Dodd-Frank. Today, he is the principal of policy and advocacy at our good friendly organization, Unidos US. But back then he was the leader of Greenline and, and he helped us to politically mobilize in California and across the nation to really fight for this important outcome that we have. And then lastly, we have another CRO board member, Lisa Rice, who serves as the CEO and president of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Lisa will join our program today at 4.30. Thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion. Danielle, I hand it over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Akitra. I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining us today. My goal is to touch on as many facets of the Bureau as time allots, but let's start by setting the stage with a little history. Congresswoman Waters and Senator Warren did an excellent job of reminding us why the Bureau became a necessity. But let's discuss some of the work uh, that went into creating the agency. Mike, can you take us back 10 years ago how were civil rights organizations involved behind the scenes in bringing the CFPB to fruition? Thank you. And as Chairwoman Waters and Congressman uh, Warren uh, described on this, uh, but I still think it is the untold story of Bob Frank, uh, but for the leadership of the civil rights groups and their core work, they were not just part of they were leaders of the coalition fighting for Dodd-Frank and specifically fighting for the CFPB. And just a couple of the places there, uh, Senator Warren talked about when she initially came out with this idea, uh, even many on the progressive side said, well, that sounds great, but it'll never happen. Um, and it was only uh, after the election and the uh, President Obama was putting together agenda that it really became a reality and a bill uh, was drafted and the for Dodd-Frank and the CFPB provisions were added in there. But the extent of opposition and how that opposition was focused most of all on the CFPB. For example, uh, the then ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee said he would vigorously oppose any Dodd-Frank bill whatsoever that contained a CFPB in it. And uh, the bill, I mean, went through bizarre course there. And it's also forgotten, you know, there was a substantial majority in the House, about 75 vote Democratic majority, but they were lobbied incessantly by industry. And the, the, the real vote, as is often the case, took place on a substitute amendment to put a totally watered down CFPB in place of what was in the bill. And it was defeated only by about two dozen votes. And but for the leadership of the Congressional Hispanic Black Caucus and the civil rights groups, that amendment likely would have prevailed and we would not have a CFPB with any robust authority uh, here today. And then as everybody knows, and we heard some, the battle continued because the next step was the Senate refused, filibustered any director to the CFPB without moves and amendments to gut the agency before it was even started. Unprecedented uh, procedures uh, and demands. And then in recent years, and it seems like ages ago, but you know, in 2017, uh, the then chairman of the House uh, Financial Services Committee promised to defund the CFPB and uh, break it, the agency back into pieces and send the authority back to the scattered agencies who had held it for decades without focus or effort to enforce it. So I think there really is a story there and the purpose of the CFPB to transition us into this talk. A key part of it was to address discrimination. Uh, the case had been powerfully made, as others have said, for example, High-income black families were more likely to get a predatory subprime loan than a low-income white family. Discrimination 
bred and launched the housing crisis. Uh, and appropriately, the CFPB was one of the key parts of how to respond to it. Uh, I think it's, it clearly has done a lot. It started in groundbreaking ways, as uh, uh, Chairman Waters and, and Senator Warren mentioned about the auto lending discrimination, which by the way, they stood up for in the face of a huge industry campaign against that. And Chairman uh, uh, Waters in the House uh, really was a powerful voice there. But that has slowed down, uh, as everyone has noted, in the last few years. And the question, I think, in this moment of reflection uh, of how do we address structural racial barriers is what role will the CFPB play in that going forward? Each of your organizations was deeply involved in the creation of the CFPB what were your objectives then and to what extent have they or have they not been fulfilled? How effective was the CFPB in living up to expectations in the first few years and how has it been doing more recently? Would you like me to respond or one? Everyone, I would, I'm hoping everyone, what, whoever feels comfortable. Great panelists, get a shot at that. Um, yes, I can start, uh, Seema Agnani. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, when the CFPB uh, was being discussed and debated or when Dodd-Frank was being debated, I was working in Queens, New York um, with um, uh, South Asian homeowners as well as uh, Black homeowners from the Caribbean, African-American. Um, and, you know, the types of mortgages that those homeowners were given, it was just uh, extremely unjust and infuriating to see the types of products that they were being targeted for. And, you know, I think working in community where um, we were working in one of the most diverse communities in the country, um, in Queens, New York, and just seeing the um, differences between what, you know, white residents of New York were getting versus those who were uh, people of color um, really um, motivated us to get involved in advocating for the creation of the CFPB. I mean, the injustices that we saw every day, the people who walked through our doors with loans that um, really just set them up for failure um, and uh, loss of savings that they had spent their life building towards um, to buy a home. So I think really just seeing those real life stories is really what led my organization at that time, um, which was a member of National Capacity, you know, to really push for um, our community to get involved in making sure that um, Dodd-Frank moved forward and that the creation of the Bureau happened. You know, as, as we were looking at it from the NAACP's perspective, it was very clear something needed to be done. As we saw the lack of regulatory protections for American consumers, homeowners, and the like, as we did the measurement, that is, when, whenever we want to manage a problem, this was clearly a huge problem. We know we have to first measure it. As we did, went through that measurement, we realized that disproportionately, the schemes that many of the, uh, the uh, financial services institutions, banks, lending institutions, and the like it brought forward were now coming to roost. People were losing their homes, losing their investments. They were losing their opportunities and really even their steps towards the future. As people think about what we do with our homes, we know that they're utilized not only for planning for retirement later. You know, you home, you invest in it, you raise your family, and then hopefully everybody grows up and moves out and mom and dad can move towards retirement. But what we saw happening was just awful. What we saw happening was those same people were actually losing that opportunity. We saw people actually finding themselves walking away from their homes. Their loans had gone underwater. Their mortgages were higher uh, than, their, than, uh, than their homes were valued. And, and as a result, we knew something much more needed to be done. So we moved as we did in Dodd-Frank to actually begin changing the, the, the law itself to make sure the regulations were in place. I believe, Mike, you and I probably testified more before the House and Senate committees, that is, the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee than anybody else I knew. They thought we were a team of two as we walked into so many of those hearings to talk about what we were hearing from our people. Now look, 
I come from an organization that has about 2,200 membership units. We have units in every state in the United States, but we also have units overseas. But the bottom line is, regardless of who we spoke to, from New York to Tennessee, from California to Michigan, it didn't matter. As we moved throughout the South, everyone was saying the same thing. Somehow or another, that promise becomes so far removed from us that quite frankly, not only we're gonna lose our homes, but we're losing the wealth that's involved in there as well. So there's so many millions of Americans saw what was happening. And we saw that it wasn't just happening directly to us that we couldn't pay, but if the house down the street that was fully paid and people were able to manage it, lived in the same community as houses went under, we saw very well that their house became worth less as well. We came up with a calculus, I believe, one that showed that for every house on your block that went into foreclosure, your house was depreciated by about $1,500 for each one. So you just count the signs on the lawn and you saw how your investment had gone south. So indeed, we knew as we put together those regulations, something else needed to be done. There was no government agency whose primary responsibility was to actually protect the American people. And with that, we knew we needed to create something. And I have to say, I give Elizabeth Warren an awful lot of credit. Because the first time I heard we were thinking about doing a new agency, I was like, well, I don't know if they're going to go. We're having a hard enough time getting them to go with these policies. But the more we talked to her, the more we sat with the White House, the more we sat with our friends on Capitol, the more we heard from our people across the country. We knew something much more needed to be done. And as we even debated over whether it's going to be a commission, an agency, all those issues were very much part of the conversation. We knew we needed what it could do. And we worked very hard to make sure we put the right pieces in place. And, and quite frankly, even more recently, and just before we got some sanity in the U.S. House of Representatives under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi as our woman speaker of the, of the House, first woman speaker, but for the second time, as you know, it was, a, it was clear to us that we could do this. And indeed we did. We fought back those attacks, but we were able to make sure we have an agency that does what it needs to, be, needs to do. I just testified before the House, just before the end of the last Congress, because there were those that want to do things in trickery to change the ability of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to do its job. Those who want to take the director's position and turn it into a, a commission, three and three, knowing that we need faster response than that. If you got six politicians sitting on a poll, present company accepted, deciding what's going to happen. Let me just say the first thing is you have the hope that one day they will actually decide. And in essence, we've been able to fight that off for the time being as well. So we knew we needed it. Our people needed it very much. Over 50% of African-American wealth was lost as a result of that economic turn, downturn. And we need a stronger Consumer Financial Protection Bureau now than any time ever before in the history of our country. Anyone else want to weigh in? Sure, if I can add, uh, Orson Aguilar with Unidos US. You know, I'll say for me, it's a, it's a personal fight, right? I, I grew up uh, in an immigrant family in Boyle Heights in, in, in LA, uh, where nearly everybody was an immigrant. And I remember when my, my parents bought their first TV, uh, they bought it with credit. I remember when they bought their first car, uh, had no, didn't know anything about financing, bought it with credit. When they tried to buy a house, uh, they lost their savings to a predatory lender. And so we, I, I grew up in the same apartment until I was 18 and went to college. And that's the reality for a lot of immigrants and for a lot of Latinos. When we saw the foreclosure crisis come, we also, we lost 66% of our wealth. Latinos lost 66% of their wealth to the crisis. And as we talk now during this crisis, we're also on the verge of losing a lot of wealth. And we can't think of another uh, as equally important in the time as now to have a strong CFPB. Uh, Senator Warren was right. Prior to the CFPB, there was no bridge, no avenue uh, for Latinos, immigrants, black people, native people, the API community and others to have their voices heard on these issues. Uh, this was all a shadow market. Uh, you know, you had companies just going after folks and they weren't selling TVs or cars, they were selling credit and they were set up, set, selling credit that was setting up people to fail, which is why we have today an enormous wealth gap uh, with people of color. And so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we understand that today is difficult, but when you look at the creation of the CFPB, 
along with six, section 342, uh, the Amwis that uh, Congresswoman Waters talked about, those were some remarkable, game-changing, visionary things that frankly, we, we, we didn't think we'd get those. And I remember organizing hard in California, Unidos US, then National Council of Raza was working hand in hand to make sure that we got those provisions. Because again, there was no bridge for Latinos and immigrants and others, right? Whether we're talking about remittances or car loans or uh, other type of credit that we see in our neighborhoods and our barrios, uh, these folks were you know, left to do their work. Uh, it was blatant and there was nobody to, there was no watchdog as Senator Warren said, no watchdog at all. The CFPB turned that around. How much in each of your estimations do you think that the CFPB has lived up to your expectations though? Can anyone can, feel free to jump I, in? I can begin if, if, that, if that's sure, helpful. Sure. Uh, to say that, uh, let me say we were off to a great start. What we had is an agency that in many ways encompassed the values that we knew we needed in providing that protection and oversight for our communities in the areas of financial services. What we saw growing out of that is a recognition and focus that every community is a little bit different. We do things a little bit differently, but we really have the same vision for what we want for our families and for our communities. And that that line of credit that's so often available should be one of those tools that helps move us in that direction. And that indeed, we needed someone to help make sure that those who are making tremendous profits off of the people in our neighborhoods and communities were also being held accountable for making sure that they weren't being jacked, if I can use a term such as that in the process. So we saw an agency that moved in the right direction. We, I can't remember ever sitting down with the head of a government agency as often as we did the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, he was wonderful in sitting down with us. He wanted to hear what we had to say. We were in that office talking about the needs of our communities and how the CFPB could respond to that, and they did. We talked about the need to expand the issues from looking at mortgages, looking at car payments, to looking at student loans, to looking at other financial services issues. The door was open as we moved through that process. Well, all of that was great until the last presidential election. And the person who made the decision of who should go in there next put one person in place that was just awful, put the other person in place just held ground on what awful could be. So in essence, we were getting what we needed in so many ways as the reports, the research is being done, as the issues are being addressed. But as we saw the change in administration, as they say, voting has its consequences. The turnout in that last election turned tied on the CFPB and we've been working as hard as we could to preserve as much of it as we can because indeed it was working for our communities and the needs of our American families. Thank you, Hillary. Did anyone else like to weigh in? This is Mike. I will jump in and following on Hillary's comments. I think we're looking at three sort of separate phases. The first under most of it under Director Cordray, standing up CFPB. I mean, part of it you got to remember this went from an agency you know, without an office uh, to 1,500 people, and there's a lot in just standing up an agency and getting all that right, especially when there are people out trying to misconstrue every step you take to use that as an excuse to shut you down. And it it was no small task to just build the institution, the different divisions, an esteemed research division, for example, an enforcement division, supervision, all from scratch was quite remarkable. And then also, they really, and this is one thing that I think they were quite successful, they had to change the culture of the entire financial market in many areas as one uh, advisor to financial companies described the change. Uh, before the CFPB, the, the conversation with their clients would go along the lines of, tell me where does it say I can't do this to consumers? And post CFPB, it changed to, uh, how do I have to show that I'm treating my consumers fairly? I mean, it is a sea change that everyone now accepts and Despite the attacks on the CFPB, everyone expects to 
be long term. So the first step, I think, is we've been in this sort of uh, step backs or, or step nowhere period for the last several years. And clearly that has, you know, we had to restart the CFPB. But again, a lot of its early work was putting in foundational rules like there was no QM rule and the, there were no rules on mortgage servicing effectively. Uh, and even still today, the rules on debt collection haven't been updated in more than two decades. Uh, and that takes a tremendous amount of time to do it properly, the research and consideration and, and proper activities. So that took up a lot of their time and some of that needs to be restarted. The for, Focusing specifically though on civil rights, the CFPB did much with the standing up the Office of Fair Lending, it's, it's prominent work on auto lending discrimination, but across the field it was active. Enforcing the prohibition against yield spread uh, premiums, greatly expanding the amount of data that had to be collected and uh, disclosed on home mortgages, the so-called HMDA uh, requirements. There's been some, you know, a lot of slowdowns and step backs there, so those need to be reversed. But then I think there's a, another phase in this time of reflection about the structural barriers. Um, so much of the financial products are designed to fit families who have the benefits of intergenerational wealth or income stability in a job market without discrimination. And unfortunately, that does not describe the world of many families of color. Uh, and we have to look at how does the CFPB really be a leadership in changing that. And some of it is, you know, testing because every test that's done shows overt discrimination is um, rampant still in our society. But then it also has to go after those so-called disparate treatment of things that quote, look neutral designs, but don't work in communities of color and practices that, again, it's one thing if you've got that family wealth and we see those disparities across the board in home mortgages, student debt, debt collection, credit reporting, and our hope at CRL and our push, quite frankly, will be that the CFPB going forward really puts this racial lens in place across all of their work, that, that the bulk of their work is the day-to-day -day work of deciding what are the standards that apply to the structure, pricing, marketing, and servicing of financial products. And those decisions right there, aside from what we sometimes cabin as fair lending work, those decisions have an immense impact on financial equality and what happens in this country. And the, the, the groups on this um, uh, call and panel have been very active. One right now that the CFPB is considering is changes and some dramatic changes, for example, to the qualified mortgage rule, which sounds like a really wonky thing, but it has a profound effect on who gets a mortgage and who does not. And that effect is amplified the most on families of color. And so I think part of our challenge as a group is how do we push the CFPB, if you will, to take that next step and take it to the next level of really being a leader in advancing racial equality. Thank you, Mike. That's actually a great segue to the next line of question, which I'm hoping will address issues of racial equity and inclusion. But before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that Lisa Rice, CEO and President of National Fair Housing Alliance has joined us. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you for being here with us. So to the entire group, how would you rate the CFPB's record on racial equity and inclusion thus far? And think about, you know, from its inception, to the sea change that happened with the 2016 election in terms of um, its effectiveness and where you'd like to see them go on these issues, especially in this most critical moment where we're seeing a bit of a racial reckoning. 
and feel free anyone to jump in. Sure, I'll jump in. Hi, everybody. And I, I apologize for being late. I had a previous commitment, but I'm uh, so happy to and honored uh, to join you in this important discussion. Um, you know, that's a very interesting question because I think that the CFPB has had uh, wins and quite frankly, failures uh, in different areas as it comes to racial equity. Uh, they have had wins in terms of helping to advance policies uh, like the use of disparate impact that was seen as something that was very controversial um, when they first embraced the idea, particularly when they announced that they were going to be uh, applying the disparate impact tool in the field of auto lending. Um, but it was an important decision to make. It was an important policy decision to make. And I think it is why we have made some of the advancement that, advancements that we have made in terms of um, helping people to be more embracing of the idea of, of using disparate impact analysis. Um, the, the Bureau's adoption of using uh, disparate impact, I think broadened disparate impact internal client uh, compliance work within lending institutions themselves. So that was a very good thing. But then they had failures as well. I mean, they had some um, disappointing uh, numbers related to what was happening in terms of uh, their internal um, um, personnel and human resources issues. Uh, related to whether or not people of color were, were re really gaining access um, to various employment opportunities within the Bureau. And you, you saw Richard Cordray come out um, very early on. First, they self-disclosed uh, to reveal that there were um, some problems. And then uh, I think the director stepped up to the plate to address those. In more recent times, we have seen uh, the Bureau roll back, quite frankly, on its commitment to advance the ball when it comes to racial equity and fairness. Um, I had to say our organization was uh, very disappointed to see uh, the proposal on qualified mortgage that the CFPB released because it decided to use a pricing concept but not Rat, ramp up or talk about the enforcement, uh, uh, the importance of fair lending enforcement um, within the context of using a pricing construct to determine what would be this new qualified mortgage, you know, this, this new good housekeeping seal of approval uh, mortgage. It's important that whenever you're going to a pricing construct um, that you have to marry that with strong fair lending compliance because pricing discrimination is so common in our financial markets. It is more the norm than it is the abnormal. Um, so I think that they've had some, some pluses and failures and I think their um, effort most recently has, has fallen somewhat short. And I, I could add to that. Uh, thank you, Lisa. There were a lot of you know great great areas where they made an advancement, but there's one big area of disappointment and an area that still hasn't been implemented, which is the small business uh, lending data rule, right? So we had this, finally, we were gonna get small business lending data and see who was getting loans, right? Just think of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program right now. We know it was a big miss first round and the SBA uh, Secretary Mnuchin, they can't even tell us who, who's getting these loans, right? Something as simple as, you know, our Native people, Latinos, Black people, our API community, are they getting these loans? Uh, the CFPB had a big opportunity to write that rule uh, 10 years down the road. It doesn't seem like we're any closer than we were when the CFPB was first erected to get that. And, and for us, that's a huge disappointment. Anyone else want to weigh in before we move on to the next question? Okay. So certainly, you know, we are seeing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have a disproportionate impact on 
families of color, particularly black, black and brown people in this country. And at the same time, you saw ProPublica publish a piece alleging ongoing lending discrimination in the financial services sector. Should the CFPB have more of an active role in rooting out this sort of discrimination? Well, I, if I could be good, I, I would argue absolutely yes. As a matter of fact, the kind of leadership and assessment we were hoping our CFP could provide for us would be as we're looking at the changing circumstances around our financial markets. As we're looking at what's happening to our economy right now is changing in a way that is extraordinary. As such, we need an agency that can actually come in and do this analysis, provide the assessments, and even recommend the solutions. That's what we're looking for from a CFP, but we're not getting that. What we're getting is something very different. Some of the same in too many ways substantiate the awful treatment that's going on now as we're seeing the old uh, debt collectors and others stepping into the fray and now doing what they were doing before we had the kind of protection in place as if it doesn't exist at all. So much more needs to be done. I have to say that the oversight we were hoping to get from a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under times such as these is woefully, woefully, woefully un unfortunate. I would agree. Uh, you know, I think um, in the midst of this crisis, rather than um, uh, the CFPB playing a role in monitoring and seeing, um, you know, as Orson pointed out, where are the PPP loans getting to on the mortgage side? Similarly, you know, instead of looking more closely at that and also doing, you know, the CFPB did a lot of education work, public education work um, since its inception, and there is a lot it could be doing right now to make sure homeowners, renters know uh, what their rights are, what um, resources are available, that it really isn't happening. Um, you know, in the, the mortgage data, the Humda data, rather than looking more closely at it, they've actually been loosening restrictions and, and reporting requirements, um, giving lenders relief rather than homeowners and renters that are really in need right now. So. Um, I think it's been going in the opposite direction it should have been. I think what's what's fascinating is we're in a point now where in, in out of desperation you may see more people turn to payday loans and other sorts of financial products that organizations like yours have fought against for years and and after seeing civil rights and consumer groups staying in opposition to payday lending and among faith leaders the call to end those loans have been particularly strong the CFPB recently changed course on its handling of payday loans uh, rescinding the bulk of the rule promulgated by the Bureau under Richard Cordray. Uh, what are your thoughts about the Bureau's approach to payday lending over the years? And, especially, and what are your concerns as we are coming into a deepening of this kind of economic downturn as it pertains to people of color, particularly black and brown folks? Well, I'll jump in. Uh, real real briefly, and, and I apologize if this has been said before, but one of the reasons that we stood up the CFPB was because we needed a regulator to, to be there on behalf of the American consumer. Um, the other prudential regulators were too much and too often in bed with and in alliance with um, lenders who were um, using abusive and discriminatory practices against consumers and the consumer's voice was was totally lost in the fray. I am not going to reveal my age, but I will say I've been around a long time. <laughs> and I remember when, for example, the, the prudential regulators would conduct their fair lending analyses and their CRA analyses, they would literally come to the um, the local communities, this is back in the 1980s, um, they would visit local communities and they would visit local fair housing organizations. They would visit local um, consumer protection groups and they would sit down and ask the hard questions about whether or not uh, lenders were meeting the credit needs of their delineated communities. Uh, they got that rich feedback. Well, they stopped that practice years ago. 
uh, and, and never really took it back up. And so we needed a regulator who would listen to the people and be on the side of the American consumer and build protections back into, infuse protections back into the system for American consumers. And recently, um, the CFPB hasn't played that role. They haven't played the role that they were designed to do. And payday lending is a great example of where they have really let down the American consumer and completely jumped in bed with payday lenders. Um, people who access payday lending uh, um, um, uh, products disproportionately are credit invisible. They disproportionately have lower credit scores. And that leads to a whole panoply of negative outcomes and deleterious effects for consumers. And so the CFPB, um, this is an area of deep frustration and disappointment for us. And I really hope that they can turn um, the course and get back on the, the side of the American consumer. If, if I could add something to that, it's why I strongly agree with everything Lisa's said. When we were setting up a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we needed someone to undercover or uncover the mischief of some of the financial services institutions. And we knew that payday lenders were at the top of that list. They didn't want to call what they were charging interest. They call it just a fee. But we ended up, when we did the final analysis, we recognized that those back-to-back -back loans that most people had to continue to be able to manage even a payday loan ended up, as a, as a CFPB shared with us prior to this new administration, that you could spend over 400% interest. Call it what you want to. But as they say, a skunk by any other name is still stinky. In essence, what we were seeing is the experiences of the American people actually being tricked and a government agency turning its back on what was happening to them. Again, what we saw those loans was absolutely outrageous. We are outraged and we need to see something much more needs to be done. The CFPB as we know it now is not what was intended. If you go back and read the, even the uh, debate on the floor of the House and the Senate under those terms, are the many, many different hearings that were held in preparation for it. This is not what it was intended to do. And I apologize for calling names. Well, maybe I don't apologize. Let me just call the names. Uh, Ms. Kraninger, who is in charge of the CFPB now, is basically sitting there very quietly. She will have a meeting from time to time, but we've seen no productive movement forward to be able to provide the protections that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was set up to create for us in the first place. In essence, we're seeing it going in the absolute wrong direction and is aiding and abetting in the kind of trickery that we're seeing coming out of, of uh, financial services agencies like uh, payday lenders and a number of others. And you know, if I may add, I think this is part of two larger trends. The first is that we have seen across multiple financial agencies, and, uh, and Hillary has been involved in this as, as others have, this opening the door to high cost credit. And almost in as many words as saying, here in the crisis for working families, the solution is you should take out a high cost loan. Um, and we all know from all the studies where that ends up. And then the stark contrast, which Central Warren pointed out in how we have treated the well-off and large companies, that some of these very lenders are getting zero interest money from the treasury and Fed programs uh, that are backed by the uh, taxpayers and funded by $500 billion of capital by the taxpayers. And so there's this stark contrast between we're anxious to help out those who need help, but the, the, not as much as others. And then for those who really need help, we're, we're not only failing to provide it many times, but offering this long-term debt and household debt, it's not surprising, is at record levels going into this crisis and debt cannot make up for, for lack of income. So the second, and I'll go quickly for others, is as, as folks talked out, we blew it in round one in many respects of the 2008 crisis. Families of color lost a generation of wealth and still have not recovered 10 years later. 
And the question is, here we are in the midst of this one, on the very brink of a major, uh, what will probably be the final COVID bill of the year. What is gonna be done now in this rest of this calendar year about making an equitable response to this crisis? And then maybe even more important, what's gonna be the recovery? You know, projections are unemployment will be high single digits through the end of next year. And that's gonna take a lot for people to, uh, to, to cope with, and we know where that hits the hardest. The numbers already show that. So is this gonna be a replay of the aftermath of the 2008 crisis? And how can a real and active CFPB play a role in making sure that's not the case, and in fact, we make some progress rather than falling so far backwards again? We're starting to get in some great audience questions, but before we turn to the audience questions, one last question from, for all of you. If you were gonna be the next CFPB director, what would be your top three priorities? Don't all go at once. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll, start, I'll start with just one so we can allow others. Is fight for racial equity. Right, right for fight for racial equity. Other panelists have said it best, right? This is a civil rights agency that's there to uncover patterns of discrimination that we see every day. And that should be your number one goal. And if I can add on to that, oh, uh, I think you're right. Oh, I'm sorry, Hillary, go no, ahead. No, no, Lisa, I'd, I'd rather take notes from you anyway. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're, we're at a place, as Orson just said, of growing inequality in America. When it comes to uh, home ownership, when it comes to housing access, when it comes to credit access, we are 100 years behind where we need to be. And residential segregation is really sort of the foundation, right? It's the bedrock of all of this inequality. We are more residentially segregated today than we were 100 years ago. When you look at the black-white racial home ownership gap, it is back where it was in 1890. That's how far apart we have grown. Racial inequality is growing. And it is growing because our systems and our structure, this, the, you know, the structure upon which all of our economic systems, our finance systems, our housing systems are built, the actual foundation, the structure is unfair. It is unequal. It's driving us toward inequality. If you think about inequality as, a, if you allow me to use the analogy of a train <laughs> on tracks, Right. For the, before the inception of this, this country, we built tracks and, and allow me to be provocative for a moment. And I, I'm going to say something that is uncomfortable, but it is, it's an inconvenient truth, but it is the truth. Black people were brought to this nation to build wealth for white people. That's why we were brought here. That's the only reason for, that's our raison d'etre. That's why we're here. And every law passed in this country is passed with that thought in mind, that goal, that purpose in mind. It's as if every law we passed is laying down tracks upon which we, we are putting a train and those tracks are heading, they're, they're directed towards racial inequality, right? So every, every law, the U.S. Constitution that built into it, you know, that infused and inculcated the system of slavery, um, the, the Indian Removal Act, the repra repatriation laws, the Chinese Removal Act, the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act, the Social Security Act, the National Highway Act, all of these laws, Jim Crow laws, right? They're, they're laying the tracks toward racial inequality. And we're all on this train, we've boarded this train, and what our government does from time to time is it gives us pieces of luggage and says, you know, I gave you a piece of luggage, why aren't you doing better for yourself? Well, 
it's because we're still headed toward this road to inequality. And what we have to do is fundamentally, we've got to change the direction that those tracks are going. And this particular CFBP right now, they're, past, they're making policy decisions that keep the train tracks headed towards racial inequality. They're doing nothing to change the direction that um, we were headed. So we've got to change that direction. And if I were CFPB director, that's the first thing that I would be doing. I would bring back disparate impact. I would start investigating uh, redlining cases. We've seen several period, uh, uh, news articles stating that the regulators are turning a blind eye to redlining practices. I, I investigate those practices, right? And address those, those policies that are really going to change the paradigm so that we are headed into headed to a road of equality and fairness uh, uh, and opportunity for everybody. Well, the, the upside of having you go first, Lisa, is it makes it easy for me to associate myself with the comments of my colleague because I could not agree with you anymore. Uh, as we're looking at the challenges, we need to go back to why we set a CFPB up in the first place. Provide the kind of protection, oversight, the kind of research, and expose these awful discriminatory practices that happen in, in, uh, financial, in the financial services arena as we've seen it. Which means we have to recommit ourselves to addressing those primary financial services issues that we all confront. We've got to address mortgages and we're seeing what's happening now. We're seeing that move to retract on the protections that we knew were so important, calling it regulatory oversight. We know that's one of the reasons we fell into the problem we did in 2008, because we did, have, did not have the kind of regulations in place to protect the American consumer, and we did not have the kind of enforcement mechanisms to make sure those particular policies were actually fully implemented. So we're going to have to get back to the basics of why we created Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Our folks are taking a hit. And we're watching what's happening with the economic circumstances throughout the country as coronavirus is viewed as that healthcare concern. But we know what the financial impact is going to be as we continue to move down this road. Even the president of the United States, who does not want to admit it, has finally come out and say it's going to get worse before it gets better. And with that, we need a stronger Consumer Financial Protection Bureau than ever before. I will begin there. I'd also begin focusing again on the, disp the disparate impact we see happening across our country. Let me say this is slightly different and a little bit aside, but I was absolutely thrown back that the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development would support a provision to actually repeal affordable and frankly further than fair housing as he's done understanding the role that that plays in the broader issues of economics in our communities. And with that, we know we need a stronger Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And quite frankly, it's a separate line, but I'll just say, Mr. Carson needs to find something else to do with his time. We need somebody that actually believes that the American people should be able to buy a home when they want to, should be able to continue to manage that home and pay those mortgages those off if they can, and make sure that we have the protections in place so that we can all really think that we might be able to achieve the American dream. Um, well, you know, I would absolutely, of course, agree with everything that's been said uh, by my esteemed colleagues. You know, I think, um, you know, the, the CFPB did an amazing job of data collection that was really core to um, a lot of its work. The research has been phenomenal, you know, until very recent, and then, of course, enforcement. So, you know, one, I would um, document everything that's been happening during this crisis so that there is room to go back later um, and, and fix things. But then, of course, the enforcement has to be, um, you know, top priority in terms of strengthening it. Um, but then thirdly, um, get back out into the community. You know, I think the CFPB did an exceptional job when it was first created to really go into communities and, and hear what's happening. Um, across the country. And so I think a combination of enforcement with that engagement um, and then really doing the research, um, including uh, race, uh, you know, more detailed race and age data that was only recently added to the mortgage data. We need to do the same 
um, with the small business data um, as soon as possible. I would add just quickly, polling shows that the public overwhelmingly supports the work of the CFPB. The public overwhelmingly supports the payday lending rule with the common sense requirement that there be an ability to repay. Nearly 80% of Republicans, as well as Democrats, support that rule. And today we are in this moment where the majority of Americans say it's time to reevaluate and recommit to addressing structural racial barriers. Uh, as uh, both Chairman uh, Waters and Senator Warren said, you, we need to think big. The public is with us on these. And the CFPB is empowered with considerable authority that it has to exercise carefully because you don't want to uh, uh, unnecessarily disrupt the markets. But there are major changes needed in the market. And the CFPB within that authority should bring a lens of racial equality and support for working families and get back to being a real force to advancing those interests. Thank you guys. Let's take a couple of audience questions. We have one from Jesse in Washington, DC. What current solutions, and I think we've addressed some of these, but would certainly like to hear your thoughts, guys. What current solutions can we implement right now to reduce and eliminate or and or eliminate the current institutional barriers to full and fair economic equity and inclusion, especially during the COVID-19 economic and public health crisis. I'm going to say it, it begins with transparency. The, the hit that we are taking now would really require for us to actually provide the kind of assessment of what's going on with access to resources. Uh, jobs. It is a, as comprehensive a solution as is a problem throughout the communities. First step, we've got to count it. We've got to do the assessment and see just where the hits are. We've got to actually collect the data to make sure that we know where to actually frame our movement to, to repair these problems. And then secondly, we've got to hold those that are, that are actually doing what they're doing now. That is, those who are involved in the predatory practices they were seeing from financial services institutions and the like are held accountable uh, for those programs and practices as well. But as things are now, if we don't have someone, a government agency in many ways, uh, they're actually providing that kind of oversight, then indeed what we're going to find is it's going to get worse and worse and there will be no fix. Are people going to take a hit and they're not going to have anything to fall back on to actually uh, pro pro provide the protections and support that every American should have, particularly under the extraordinary circumstances of this pandemic. I, I would add that we are distributing, as many have acknowledged, historic, out of the ballpark in the entire history of our country, amounts of assistance in, in response to this crisis. And following up on what Hillary Shelton just sh shared, you, we distributed over half a billion dollars of PPP loans without checking to see where they were going to, did they serve businesses of, of color, and without even complying with an explicit directive in the statute to make sure that they served underserved markets and to have a specific program for that. Uh, we stand again, you know, the next COVID package is probably uh, somewhere between one and two trillion dollars, which again is historic amounts of money that hopefully we won't see flowing around in the next decade, if not longer. And at the top of it has got to be making sure that there's equitable benefit and distribution and measurement and accountability of these totally remarkable uh, uh, programs. Certainly, uh, our second question here dovetails quite nicely with Mike's point about the uh, pending debate of, over the next Stimulus Act. Uh, this question is from Gregory Squires. What do you hope will be the result of the current debate over the HEROES Act? 
I didn't say, but that our, our primary hope in the NAACP is that we can get it through the Senate. Uh, being able to move this important legislation through after the very careful calculus that went into cre uh, creating it uh, is something that's necessary. Uh, it is it's still, it, I'm, I'm left speechless when I look at the work that went into passing that bill in, a, in the House, a bill that will provide over $3 trillion of the kind of assistance for stimulus and otherwise that the country very well needs to speak to not only those health concerns, but also move us from the point that we're worried about now and then millions of Americans are going to actually be put out on the streets because they can't pay their rent. So indeed, we're going to have to take on the Senate and make sure they live up to their responsibilities as well. There's a very similar bill pending before this House bill went over. The Senate bill is standing there. We've got, uh, we have a leadership in the Senate, quite frankly, for those of you who aren't paying attention, uh, who held a luncheon in which many of his members walked out as the leader of the, of the uh, party on that side, decided that uh, there was a particular approach. They said, I can't even go home with what you put on the table for us right now. Mm -hmm. And that walked out on the meeting. So we've got that kind of, of uh, problem going on in the U.S. Senate right now, the disagreement not only between parties, but within parties, put us at a stalemate as we're experiencing now. The hope is that they're going to come out with a better idea. But quite frankly, what you have is a piece of legislation now that has already passed the House of Representatives. That's 435 people they had to go through to get it to this point. It is before the United States Senate. They need to do their job and address the real issues and concerns of the American people to make sure that indeed, number one, our health concerns are taken care of because we hit over 4 million Americans contracting coronavirus. And behind that, we're seeing over 130,000 143,000 people, excuse me, uh, that have actually died as a result of it. But we're holding back funding, we're slowing down progress, and indeed, so much more needs to be done. Our fingers and our faces need to be pointed towards the Senate side of Capitol Hill. And we should demand that those people who are paid a significant sum of money that will not see a lessening of their paycheck, will not see a reduction in their health care, will not see other problems along those lines, would have to prepare, ugh, excuse me, would have to provide for the American people that are now find themselves literally on the brink of homelessness. Yeah, and I would just add the CARES Act, a lot of the sort of equity building provisions that we tried to get into the CARES Act uh, got stripped out. A lot of stuff got stripped out on the Senate side so we have to pass the HEROES Act because the, if we just have CARES, if that's the only law we have, CARES will end up being um, another law. You know, I talked about those laws that build the tracks toward inequality, but that's what CARES Act does. It, it primarily provides protections for homeowners, not renters. There are no equity provisions for uh, renters in the CARES Act. And you heard people talking about how the PPP program, which was supposed to be this great equalizer in terms of providing support for all businesses, actually didn't provide support for uh, uh, businesses that are owned by people of color. Um, the other thing is that the CARES Act only covers 70% of the mortgage market. So 30% of the mortgage market isn't even um, it doesn't even receive all of the protections that are provided under the CARES Act, and people of color are disproportionately represented in that 30% that isn't covered. So passing HEROES is really critically important because HEROES uh, includes those equity conscious provisions that we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to, uh, it's been emphasized already, but, you know, we really haven't done anything for renters beyond these small checks that went out to people. So um, really need to see something done for low wage workers, the essential workers that we love so much. We need to take care of, um, of our workers in this country, many of whom are people of color. 
So I think we have time for maybe two more audience questions. Uh, this one really quickly from Taylor in Colorado. Are there any options available to restructure the CFPB to address the Supreme Court's decision allowing the removal of the director without cause? Well, I would start by echoing uh, Hillary Shelton's remarks that one of the uh, ways, and it in some ways is a Trojan horse uh, attack on the CFPB is by those who say they want to convert it to a commission. And this was a big fight when the CFPB uh, was established. And uh, what we have found over the last decades is that uh, commissions, particularly those that don't have strong bipartisan support that are controversial. The commission structure is used to effectively disable the agency in its entirety. Uh, I mean, we see our Federal Elections Commission unable to even have a quorum to call a meeting and take action uh, because that's a way to block it. I mean, we saw with the CFPB at the very start when uh, after it was enacted, there was a filibuster of any uh, appointment for director, any without regard to who it was or their qualifications, uh, in, unless they would agree to change the structure and put other things in to weaken it. Uh, so the you know the commission sometimes offered is, oh, it's going to make it more stable, this or that. But it, at the end of the day, the evidence is overwhelming that a commission turns it into a location of in, inactivity and where in, uh, in, in the best of times, it does maybe a little and no harm. And then the worst of times, it's as bad as we have seen in recent times in agencies with commissions. They've tended to be as activists moving things back as single directors. And so that would be the first thing. We are wary of those who, who, who claim they want to restructure to help it. Uh, most presidents, you know, we have other agencies that are headed by single uh, directors, uh, including the OCC, uh, who it's clear is removable uh, at will. Uh, many other agencies, all the cabinet agencies are single uh, directors um, and they work fine. And the CFPB can work there as well. The, so those are subject to removal at will by the president, but most presidents face enough political pressure that removing a, a agency head for doing popular work is not something they do lightly. And our last question, which I think is a fun one, uh, who should be the next CFPB director? If you had your druthers, who would it be? I, I think I put Mike Calhoun in that seat if I had the opportunity. I second that. I second that motion. <laughs> well, but, but let me just say, someone that understands the role that, that agency plays is crucial. We've seen, we've seen a man serving that role, we've seen a woman serving that role, and we've seen the differences in how the policies around them uh, and the political powers, quite frankly, impact on what they're going to do with it. So we need someone that will, will go in understanding that they have to do the right thing for us. Be very thoughtful of the diversity that is the United States of America, that we fall in many different racial, ethnic, but also many different economic circumstances as well that we know the predatory lenders as we've seen and predatory bankers as we've also sadly experienced are those that would very well come after us in many, many different ways. So we need someone that can respond very quickly and very assuredly. Uh, what we've seen happen now is that as these problems happen, one of the reasons, as Mike was laying out very clearly, that they're pushing for a commission, more than one person making those decisions, quite frankly, not like the Department of Justice, quite frankly, not like the Department of Labor, not like the Department of Health and Human Services, not like any of the other departments that have one person sitting at the helm because they have to make decisions very quickly. In many cases, we've seen what predatory lenders do. 
They come in, they offer one package that is discriminatory against people that are actually taking advantage of them, quite predatory in nature. And then we've seen that the minute we find out an opportunity to go after them, they move it over, change its name, call it something different, and continue to exploit the American people, particularly racial and minorities in our country. So with that to say, we need someone that recognizes how that, that plays and is not afraid to go after those that would actually damage the American spirit, that those who would actually stand up and make sure that everyone is protected, that indeed equal protection, equal opportunity under law is not just a slogan, but it's actually a constitutionally guaranteed right in our country. We need to make sure we put somebody in place that would carry it forward as it was intended. So again, the American people, even those that work paycheck to paycheck are protected as they move to secure their families in our financial services arena. And then you all know I'm not one of your panelists today, but I think we'd all be remiss if we didn't think about someone who would also appreciate that discrimination hurts the economy overall. Absolutely. And fell into stop it has real ramifications. Just last year, McKinsey and Company did a report that showed that discrimination that targets African Americans hurts the economy about a trillion to a trillion and a half. And that if we address that discrimination by 2028, we'd actually see our GDP grow by four to six percentage points. Well, Nikita, if that's the case, I vote for you. That's what I was gonna say, I vote for Nikita. <laughs> or, and we have panelists here, we have Seema, we have Lisa. There's no shortage of folks that fight for racial equity every day uh, that are ready to take up the helm. All right. Well, thank you everyone on this panel for your insights and, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today. It has been an awesome conversation. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Back to you, Wade, for our closing wow. remarks. Well, thank you, Danielle. You have done an extraordinary job as the moderator of a wonderful panel this afternoon. So thank you so much uh, for your time and your thoughtfulness. And to the uh, incredible panel, that was assembled for uh, this commemorative discussion. Uh, you guys rock, and you really brought uh, incredible insights and recommendations for change in a way that can't help but open new opportunities to address uh, some of the issues that were the centerpiece today. I, I wanna again thank the Center for Responsible Lending uh, for sponsoring uh, this really thoughtful and provocative discussion. Uh, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the CFPB, an agency that stands at the intersection of consumer protection, uh, civil rights, and economic racial discrimination. And uh, we have been so fortunate to have the work of Nikitra uh, Bailey, who uh, has just played such an important role in the work of, of CRL and the work of the CFPB. We've obviously also had two incredible, um, really uh, keynote addresses from uh, both Chairman, Chairwoman Maxine Waters of the House Financial Services Committee and Senator Elizabeth Warren of the Banking Committee in the Senate. Uh, again, it, this would not have been an appropriate acknowledgement of CFPB and the work of the Dodd-Frank bill had those two uh, not uh, participated. So it's, it's really quite incredible. And I just have a few uh, closing observations to make, and I'll, I'll try to uh, keep them uh, brief. You know, our discussion today has brought out several important themes and, and calls for action. Uh, first, um, it has added to the history of, the, of Dodd-Frank and how it came out of discriminatory subprime lending uh, that was heavily targeted against communities of color and the ensuing financial crash that lending ultimately caused. It further reminds us of the critical role that the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and the civil rights organizations played in ensuring that a strong CFPB was part of Dodd-Frank and that it was subsequently defended. Uh, without that support, the CFPB with robust authority would not exist today. Uh, Dodd-Frank and the CFPB were granted specific authorities to combat racial discrimination, such as the Office of Minority Women Inclusion uh, and all of the offices of, of the regulators and the statutory CFPB Office of Fair Lending. Uh, these produced important strides in their early years 
and the Office of Fair Lending began seriously focusing lender attention to address fair lending obstacles. Inherently discriminatory mortgage yield spread premiums that drove abusive lending in the housing boom were banned by Dodd-Frank. However, fair lending efforts and enforcement has diminished in recent years, and it must be reinvigorated. It must be uh, strengthened to carry out uh, the full-throated uh, 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 requirements of that office. Uh, perhaps most important of the CFPB's authority is the day-to-day -day work of the, that the Bureau uh, does in determining the standards for how essential financial products and services are designed and delivered. Uh, these products and services are the tools of financial advancement or the traps of long-term financial distress. Too often today, these products are still are built and implemented in ways that further structural racial barriers. Loan eligibility, pricing, and servicing remain tilted against families that carry the impact of historic and continuing discrimination. The future agenda and work of the CFPB must bring this lens uh, to its work and to fully carry out uh, its role in providing fair opportunities to all. And we who helped establish and defend the CFPB must ensure that it honors this responsibility. As long as there is inequity, discrimination, and prejudice, we are obliged and responsible for being the voices that really demand better. So I want to close today by thanking the audience who tuned in today to participate in this program. Thank you for your really thoughtful questions about the CFPB. And thank you for helping to provide a mandate and a commitment to really reinvigorate the work of the CFPB so that when we come back in another 10 years to commemorate its 20th anniversary, we will have seen the kinds of structural changes that all of us want and that many of you talked about today. Thank you so much for joining this publication uh, and this program. So back to uh, Nikitra, is it you? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Wade, for that. And to you, Danielle, for being an excellent moderator. And to you, Seema and Mike and Orson and Hillary and Lisa, we appreciate everyone attending today. Make it a great one. Thanks, guys. We're going to sign off. Yes. Thanks, guys. Bye.